Welcome everyone, thanks to those who have joined us already. We're just going to give people a few more minutes to join and then we'll begin the webinar. Welcome again, everyone. Thanks for joining this IRM webinar. We're delighted to have here with us today, Sean Arrowsmith, one of IRM's directors and our principal technical consultant, Alexander Zavulov. Today's webinar will focus on real life examples of red teaming exercises from a text perspective, plus advice from Sean on the differences between pen testing and red teaming, and how to talk to the board about the importance of investing in scenario-based exercises like red teaming. If you do have any questions during the webinar, just use the speech bubble in the menu on the left hand side of your screen. Your question won't appear to other attendees. Uh, we will have time for a couple of questions at the end, um, but we will respond to all questions asked following the session. So you'll receive a Q&A summary next week along with the recording. OK, so over to you, Sean. Thanks, Sam. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, just a quick intro to, to who we are and, and the sort of reasoning behind this. IRM is the world-class expertise centre of the Altran Group in, in cyber security. So we provide consultancy services, but including uh, the very technical kind of end of the spectrum, which is where the red teaming work exists, but also you know, uh, governance, risk, compliance, policies, process, procedural side of things. And we have a, a software platform called Synergy uh, to manage GRC ongoing. So there's just a quick snapshot overview of, of the company if you're, if you're not familiar with us. But as I said, um, one of the key areas that we provide services in is the technical end of IT security and information security, which is uh, red teaming. So today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the differences between pen testing and red teaming. You know, there's quite, quite there's some sort of nuanced differences between the two disciplines and how they're, how they're delivered. Then we're going to look at what, what are the questions that you typically get from the board. So what do the execs ask when you go to talk to them about the perspective of doing a red team exercise uh, and you know the type of questions that they're likely to want answered and then also you know what what are the drivers from an exact point of view why should they commission a red team exercise why is it of value to them as an exec and you know what are the, what are the drivers behind that decision uh, and, and being a good decision then we're going to talk about some of the common pitfalls you know this is a, a live red team exercise sometimes things don't go 100 percent according to plan and you know you come across some some surprises on on occasion. So we're going to talk about some of the common ones through our years of experience that we've we've seen um, whilst delivering the service. And then my colleague Alex is going to talk through some sort of detailed red teaming tales and some scenarios from real life examples in in delivering this service to our customers. So that was just a quick summary of uh, of content. So let's move on to to the next part of the topic. Right, so what is the difference between pen testing and red teaming? So this slide really talks to the fact that, that a pen test is often uh, a scope bound, short exercise, normally lasts you know five to ten days maximum. Whereas a red team, we run over a longer duration because we're trying to really give much more of a clear simulation of how serious and organised crime would actually operate in attacking an organisation, and they will do it over a longer duration on the premise that it's easier to come under the radar, it's low and slow, it's very difficult to detect the activity. So whereas with the pen test we'll be told, right, here's an application that we've just developed, come and test that in isolation. Uh, with a red team, we'll, we'll spend more time and, you know, we're really trying to simulate the, the way the, uh, the tactic, ta uh, tactics, techniques and procedures used by, by organised crime and, and people that are actually attacking companies and trying to breach companies. The, in a pen test, it's overt, it's, it's known to the business that it's happening. In a red team, the audience that knows about the activity is normally quite reduced, typically you know, led by, by the chief information security officer or head of information security, but also you know, members of the board are likely to know about it, typically you know, HR director, legal director. Um, so, but, there, but there is a very small audience that, that tends to know about a red team. And the reason for that is because we want to see how 
the organization that we're actually performing the red team against responds to what we're doing. So we want to see how well they defend against the red team exercise. And you get that kind of red team versus blue team value there that, that really puts them through their paces in terms of how they defend against the activities that we undertake. Um, as I said before, pen test combined by scope, red teaming is free form and holistic. So we, we cover the entire organization. There's much more about a real world simulation of, of how organized crime will, will, will operate. And you know, for, for that point of view, we need to make sure that we're testing people, process and technology, not just the technology itself. And a, and a pen test tends to focus uh, just on the, on, the, on the kind of technology stack. So as I said before, you know, developed a new application for e-commerce as a, as a retailer. I want to get this tested as part of my overall general assurance program and assurance activities. Finally, you know, in terms of the results that come out, it's much more of a, a narrative about how we carried out the exercise with the red team, whereas with a pen test, you're actually just simply pointing out the findings and vulnerabilities that you've discovered in the course of delivering the pen test. So it's much more of a technical document, whereas our red team report focuses on not just you, you, you know the, the narrative, but also how the organization responded to our attacks, what was our kind of general um, feel in terms of, of how the, the red team went, and, and also translate that into real business speak in terms of business impact so that the execs can understand, you know, if we found uh, a SQL injection in an application and managed to compromise a, a website, what does that actually mean to them as an organization? Because actually it's the impact of, of that that discovery that's more important necessarily than the technical finding in this context. And the audience, as we've already said, tends to be a much more senior level, a much more business level within the organization. Whereas with the pen test, it's, it's very much focused on, on a technical audience that, that wants to digest the findings from, from, the, from the report. So I just want to talk through uh, an example where the value of red teaming was seen by one of our customers who was a financial services organization with a pretty mature assurance regime and, and security program in place. And you know, the client did a, a lot of pen testing work. You know, they had a good assurance process in terms of new releases on applications and new products and new new projects. So they would they would do pen testing as part of that, that security lifecycle within the project. Uh, and they, they'd heard about red teaming as a, as, a, as a good thing to do within the financial services industry and talk to their peers within within industry to, to go and try this out. So we were commissioned to do a red team on top of the, the, the traditional kind of pen testing we are already doing. And we managed to compromise all their internal systems through an attack route that they hadn't really considered, which was a physical ingress into the building of, of the company in, in, in question and placing a device on their network or a, a Raspberry Pi device, which we then remoted into to gain access to internal systems. And, you know, they hadn't pen tested internally before, and it was a bit of an eye opener. But the main thing was that it really opened their eyes to the importance of red teaming as another assurance activity that's really, really useful and of great value to an organization on top of the traditional kind of pen testing approach uh, that a lot of organizations take. And the reason behind that is because it's a much more holistic approach, whereas you know, pen testing is, as we said before, looking at a technical system in isolation of the rest of the organization and the people and processes that interact with that technology. So uh, you know, a great example of, of seeing the value of, of red teaming through delivering that to, to one of our, our customers. So I'm going to move, move on now, as we said in the summary, to talk about the areas that boards tend to, to ask about when you're when you're kind of pitching red teaming to them as a concept. Uh, and the first one is is why? And the question that always comes up with boards is why why are criminals going to attack us? Why why is cyber important to us? Why why are they interested in us? You know, we, we make widgets as a manufacturer, so I don't that quite understand uh, what, what the point would be. There's surely more lucrative targets out there than us. Now, you know, the answer to that is, well, you transact money, you're a business, there is a way to extract money from you as an organization. Even if you're just a manufacturer of widgets, you are still of interest because there is money to be taken. And actually, if you're in manufacturing, perhaps you'll be seen to have a lower level of maturity potentially to a potential aggressor. So it's not so much about 
what you do and your profile as an organization it's just the fact that if i can intercept an invoice and change the bank details to make you pay money into my bank account rather than the intended bank account then you're, you're an interesting target to to me as a, a member of organized crime so that's the why and then you know a, a red team is a much more significant investment than a traditional pen test so you know you're going to have to spend quite a bit more money on a red team than traditionally you would have done on, on pen testing and the question that comes to the board is it really worth all the financial investment so you need to think about you know the kind of long-term view here so if you're if you're seen to be doing pen testing in isolation that's great but is, if you if you're also running you know, annual red teaming exercises to really test the full fabric of your organization from um, people process and technology to be more holistic and, and understand a much broader picture in terms of cyber maturity and that's a great thing because you know if the worst god forbid does happen and you suffer a breach and you're being audited by by the ico or a regulator and you know you can demonstrate to them that you're doing red teaming on top of uh, regular or assurance activities then it's only going to go in your favor in terms of mitigating factors around uh, potential monetary penalties and the like so you know it, it just it's a it's a really good way of demonstrating a much more robust cyber program and mm -hmm. and approach and the next question that often comes up is is who so what are what are our competition doing uh, are we you know are they doing it too so there's there's a great sort of view in terms of uh, I, I want to be seen to be doing the right thing within the context of my industry so it's worth researching talking to peers within your industry about what they do around red teaming and, and having those examples to hand uh, when that question comes up and then finally the what so you know the unknown of red teaming can be quite a significant barrier um, so you really need to be clear and articulate what you're testing and the fact that yes you might find things that are not particularly palatable in terms of you know bad controls and poor security practices but that's the very point of the exercise is to actually identify those areas that could be exploited and allow you to improve those controls to improve your security posture as an organization so uh, whilst whilst you know that sometimes you find things that you perhaps don't want to know about that the whole point is to find out those things and the red team exercise is an excellent way of doing that So why, why has red teaming grown in popularity over, over the years? Well, actually, 20 years ago when IRM first started, all the testing that we ever did was around the scenario. So, you know, what is the scenario that you're trying to uh, reenact as, as you're doing some testing? So is it, is it a contractor on site plugged into your network to see what they can do? Or is it, you know, you've left a laptop in a, in a black cab and, and when we get hold of that laptop can we use that to then gain access to your organization so we, we would always create a scenario in the early days but i think over time um the testing industry changed to be much more scope bound pen testing on specific systems and applications so there's been a bit of a change there but the other thing that's happening is there's much more of an increase in regulation uh, and awareness so you know gdpr coming along much higher monetary penalties the nis directive all these things are driving execs to think actually we need to think about how we stand up and defend against attacks from very sophisticated groups of people who are going to use not just technical hacking techniques but also you know they might pay someone to come physically into our office it might be a cleaner to plug something into the network um, and give them some cash for doing that and use that as a way in so you, you really need to explore a much broader picture in terms of the threats that you face uh, and, and as a result of that what we're seeing as you can see up on the slide is that um, threat-led testing is starting to become making a comeback in terms of scenarios and, and going back to that way of thinking and the way of delivering uh, testing engagement and in particular red teaming so just going to talk now around the different drivers from an exec so if i'm an exec why, why should i think of this as a, as, a, as a useful and valuable exercise to my organization well, clearly there are regulatory pressures and the impact and risk around, you know, contravening regulations and, and policy. You know, particularly things like GDPR, where there's you know huge media attention, and organisations need to really understand that the the effectiveness of their technical and organisational security controls. And you know, as I said before, if you all seem to be doing a red team exercise as part of your overall assurance activity, then that 
can A be a good thing if you have to stand up a, and, and be questioned by a regulator or by the ICO in the event that you might uh, have a breach? So, you know, it is a good thing to be able to demonstrate to those organisations to show that you take security seriously and, and, and uh, that contributes towards your meeting regulatory requirements and, you know, things like, like GDPR. Um, reputation, of course, is, is key to, to exact. The reputation of the organisation is absolutely critical. We know of examples, obviously, where people have been breached and they haven't handled that uh, breach particularly well. A red team exercise allows you to kind of rehearse that. So if you see the activities coming through and the way in which you're going to get compromised, you can then translate that into a training act activity in terms of uh, how you would perhaps present that to the, to, to the outside world if you were questioned around it by journalists or something like that. So, so a red team exercise is a really good way to understand you know, how you would handle that reputational risk as a result of being compromised uh, by any means by, by whichever uh, actor, the threat actor that, that, that's going to compromise you. So share price and market share, that's clearly a, a massive consideration for a listed organisation and the board of directors around that, that listed organisation. We have looked at the share price and what's quite interesting is that post breach there is always a dip in share performance. So you're always going to see some sort of decrease in shares. Uh, and there was a, a recent study by a research firm called Comparatech that saw that about a 4% decrease in share value uh, off the back of a, of a breach. But interestingly, after the initial drop, the share prices tend to come back you know, within about a month. However, what they did was look at uh, the, the longer term impact on, on share price. And you know, after a year, share prices will be underperforming by an average of about 5% um, on, in, in general, and then increasing to about 12% within two years and 16% at three years. So you know, most organizations, you don't see an immediate massive impact on share price. However, as they sort of struggle to recover and have to deal with the monetary impact of that, et cetera, um, that has a negative impact on share price. And the final thing, which I think is quite an interesting thought, is consumer awareness. What I think we're starting to see is people being much more aware about cybersecurity as a business enabler, i.e. if I go to one bank, you know, bank A, and I want to open a bank account, and um, I'm also looking at bank B that has a similar product to open a bank account, but bank B demonstrates to me that they have much more robust cybersecurity programs in place, they handle it better then you know, I'm going to start thinking I'm going to go with the more secure option. So I think what we're going to see over time um, is that, that consumer awareness around you know, making choices on, on who you go and consumer service from. Um, and you know, Red Team, whilst you're probably not going to divulge exactly what happens within a Red Team exercise, you can talk in general about a very robust assurance programme and cybersecurity programme that's in place to protect uh, customers' information and data. So I think you know it all makes up part of that that um, sensible cyber hygiene. So what does a red team actually provide? So whenever we go and sit and talk with an organisation about uh, doing a red team exercise, the first thing we start with is what sort of level of threat actor are you facing? So the point there is to make sure that it is absolutely aligned with the reality that that organization faces in terms of the threat actors that are going to be interested in them. You know, a nation state might be interested in a utility company or a critical national infrastructure organization. However, they're less likely to be interested in, you know, a luxury goods retailer or something like that, which would be more around the crime syndicates and syndicates for hire. So therefore, we always look at the, the level of threat actor that we're simulating within a red team to give an organization uh, a clearer view and a picture of how they would respond to an attack from someone of that level of sophistication and using the same techniques, tactics and procedures as those organisations or people. Um, so yeah, to always start with who is the threat actor and who are we emulating or simulating as part of the Red Team exercise. So finally, what does it actually provide? Well, we test different threat levels. Uh, so the ones that we just described on the previous slide around different threat actors and different levels of sophistication. You get a much broader range of 
uh, assessment, I guess, of your security controls from, you know, physical security right through to uh, people's awareness, so staff awareness, can I tailgate, do I get challenged, can I social engineer information out of help desks, so it's a much broader range of tests of uh, organisational security controls. And of course, it emulates real world threats. So we're really actually using the threat intelligence that we gather around that industry and the type of attacks that are being launched against organisations in similar sectors. So you get a really good idea of how, how, how effective your current security posture is, but also, you know, that all the investment that you've made in your security programme, how, how is that standing up to actual attack uh, in this case? And then people focus. So yeah, we, we absolutely do focus around the whole people process and technology piece, uh, as opposed to just focusing on the technology. Um, so that's my bit done. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Alex, who's one of our principal consultants, who's going to talk in a bit more detail about the actual delivery of, uh, of Red Team. Thank you, Sean. Um, Red teaming has its own boundaries and limitations. Uh, so from the client side perspective, you need to think about who in your team you should inform about a red team project that is about to be launched at your company. Do you need to inform your entire legal department, your HR department, or only certain members of your team about the project? So if certain individuals find out that they're being the targets of a certain phishing campaign, for example, they might get seriously offended by that. But on the other hand, if you inform every colleague working for your company about the red team project, they will obviously be a lot more vigilant. They will be expecting something bad to happen, be it a phishing campaign, a physical intrusion, or a scan of the external infrastructure. And that will obviously reduce the overall effectiveness of the campaign and make the results inaccurate. Uh, so there was one client that required us to communicate with only a single member of the technical team during the entire red teaming project. So any technical issues and concerns, so for example, when can we launch a phishing campaign? Can we break into the building on this date? Can we carry out any attacks after business hours? Uh, all that had to be communicated with that, with that technical point of contact uh, via a secure mobile messaging app. Uh, we couldn't even have any direct email communication because that person's inbox was being monitored 24 seven by the, secure, the company's security operations center, also known as the SOC or the blue team. Uh, obviously, if we did send an email to them, uh, the SOC would immediately find out that, that and that would compromise the entire project. Uh, areas of sensitivity. Uh, so there was one client that allowed us to target only specific office locations. They had more than one, obviously, uh, but that was further limited by the specific areas of the office that we could break into. Uh, we also couldn't steal any physical uh, devices or computers from their office uh, due to the type of uh, sensitive data those devices contained. Uh, and that was uh, obviously uh, that obviously limited the type of activities we could carry out on their site. Another client, for example, they stated clearly that if we managed to gain access to one of their computers, uh, under no circumstances, we were allowed to open any of the documents stored on those computers uh, due to the type of sensitive and secret data that could be found in such files. We could only take a note of the name of the actual documents and then move on. Uh, in addition to that, we had to be monitored by one of their technical staff and keep the client up to date with every step we made, uh, be it physical intrusion, launching our attacks, um, from, from uh, launching our attacks from a physically implanted hacking device, uh, attempting to escalate our privileges on a domain joint machine, and so on. All that had to be monitored by the client. Uh, we had to log every command we typed and had to confirm if we could actually carry out such activities before actually performing them. Um, the scope of a Red Team project can also be quite limited. So there was one client that required us to completely disregard launching any type of Wi-Fi attacks on site because they had so many third-party clients uh, connected to their Wi-Fi network every single day, uh, they were worried if, let's say, we managed to hack into the Wi-Fi network, uh, we could potentially start scanning the IP addresses belonging to those third-party clients, and that would obviously be a legal infringement, uh, and that would be completely out of scope. Uh, that same client actually advised us that breaking into any embedded or IoT devices on site was prohibited, uh, because those devices had to be available 24-7, and we couldn't possibly try and tra tamper with them and potentially even cause a denial of service condition, even for a very brief moment, moment uh, that would cause a significant uh, impact on the infrastructure. Uh, obviously, that was completely out of scope. 
Uh, and it's also not quite, uh, it is also quite common that, let's say, if you find sensitive information uh, on the dark or deep web um, about a specific high level individual working for the company, you cannot blackmail them in order to retrieve some sensitive data from them. Uh, a real criminal obviously wouldn't care about that. But during a red team project, that is normally not in scope. Uh, legal, legal issues. Uh, not uh, many people know, but you cannot replicate brands. Uh, so sending out phishing emails with the cost of Microsoft branding or Starbucks, for example, is a leg legal infringement. Uh, unless you have a legal agreement with that company, you can't possibly try and replicate their web pages uh, for phishing, for example. If they find out you use their brand for your campaigns, that could be a that could cause a major legal uh, infringement. Um, so you better come up with a company or a brand that does not exist. And finally, output requirements. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, for our clients to obviously require a final report at the end of the engagement. Uh, the report normally includes a, an executive summary, an executive conclusion, also includes a big technical section explaining what kind of attacks uh, we launched at the company, what data we managed to retrieve and so on. Uh, the report obviously also includes ways to uh, fix the identified issues. Uh, however, there was one client uh, that uh, did not require a detailed red team report to be sent to them at the end of the engagement. Uh, what they required instead is a technical call or a debrief with their blue team informing them that they had been under attacks for the past couple of months. Uh, the SOC then had to spend a, a few weeks uh, trying to forensically identify such attacks and traces of our red team campaign. Uh, we would then have to have another technical call uh, with the SOC in a few weeks' time, and then we would compare the results with what they managed to find with the actual attacks that we uh, launched at them throughout the past few months. Uh, the client wasn't too concerned about the success about uh, the red team and if we could gain domain admin privileges, for example. They were more concerned about how effective their blue team was at detecting and uh, blocking different red team attacks. That obviously included phishing, physical intrusion, infrastructure scans, malicious device implanting, and so on. Uh, so these are just a few boundaries and limitations you as a red team need to consider. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, some very useful red team phases um, and uh, that, that we normally carry out during almost every red team project. Uh, this is not obviously a complete list, but uh, uh, that's, not, that's what we normally perform. So the first and the most important phase, uh, and that's the phase we carry out during the very beginning of our project is the OSINT phase, also known as Open Source Intelligence Gathering. Uh, OSINT allows you to utilize publicly available sources, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and other social networking sites, uh, to generate a portfolio uh, of key employees and stakeholders that you can then target during your, red team, uh, during your phishing campaigns and red team projects. So you can obtain a list of uh, key employees within the organization. You can learn about their lifestyle and their hobbies, and then you can come up with a very sophisticated spear phishing scenarios tailored, tailored to that uh, particular individual uh, or a small group of individuals. So for example, let's say you identify a target, uh, a high level employee, and you know they enjoy playing rugby on the weekends and you know where they live uh, based on their social media information. Uh, so you can then send an email pretending to be a, a small rugby club, uh, inviting them to participate in a match or complete a short survey in the attached malicious word document or point them to a link uh, uh, hosting a malicious file on the cloud, for example. So if they open that document uh, on their work machine and, uh, and let's say you manage to bypass uh, their, work, their work machines on host security measures such as the antivirus solution, the intrusion prevention system installed on the machine, you will essentially gain a remote control of that machine. Uh, and in addition to that, it's uh, not uncommon to see employees posting pictures of their work environment and take selfies even uh, in front of their workstations. And they post that information on social networking sites uh, without realizing the type of information you can actually ret retrieve from such pictures. That can be Wi-Fi passwords on uh, sticky notes attached to their monitor, the type of equipment they use, uh, the type of workstations, laptop models they have, and so on, all, all that can be used to, uh, very useful to a red teamer. Um, so once we're done with the human element uh, of the OSINT, uh, we also try to identify what kind of infrastructure and services the client has exposed to the internet. Uh, we could then, uh, let's say, attempt to identify and exploit vulnerabilities in the infrastructure that is exposed to the internet. Uh, if 
we identified different <coughs> login interfaces that the company uses, such as uh, VPN service, remote desktop, uh, WordPress logins, and so on. And we managed to, let's say, capture a set of credentials uh, during a phishing attack. Uh, we could attempt to log into those interfaces with the obtained credentials. So this particular phase is very useful. We always try and carry out it during the very beginning of the of the of the of the red team campaign. Uh, another useful uh, phase, uh, provided that's in scope, uh, is when we attempt to retrieve a physical device from the client side. Um, Having the ability to steal a device or a computer from the client side can, can provide a, a lot of information uh, to a red team engagement and to, to a red team, uh, particularly if the hard drive that's retrieved from the workstation is unencrypted. Uh, so the hard drive can be cloned uh, and then you can create an image of the hard drive and you can retrieve so much useful information from the disk, such as Outlook OST files, uh, storing all the inbox of all the users who had logged into the laptop or that workstation in the past. Uh, you obviously retrieve information about the antivirus solution, the um, exact operating system, be it Windows 7 or Windows 10, uh, if there is a web proxy enforced, if there is any advanced port security measures enforced, such as 802.1x and so on. So, and in addition to that, if you, let's say, you retrieve the device from uh, the tech department, you can also try and uh, retrieve some sensitive technical data from the hard drive, such as uh, hard-coded uh, credentials. It's not uncommon to get that kind of information kind of information. Uh, if, let's say, you do manage to retrieve the device from uh, the HR department or the finance department, you can steal some PII data, uh, including employee payroll information, salary details, medical records, and so on. So if that particular phase is in scope, we try and carry out it uh, during every red team campaign. And the final phase uh, uh, that we always try and include in our project is uh, the human social engineering phase. Um, for example, let's say you're trying to break into a building by identifying some entry points, uh, a back door, a smoking area, an underground car park, and so on. You tailgate a member of staff. You can obviously, that can provide a very easy way to gain entry into the main office area. Um, let's say if you approach a receptionist and you use different social engineering techniques, you pretend to be an electrician or something, uh, or you pretend like you have a, an important meeting with some high level employee working for the company, uh, and then in the meantime, you ask them if you could use the restroom. If they are not very security vigilant, they might let you through the turnstiles and you, you'll be on the other side of the, uh, of the office and you'll be able to freely roam the area. If the receptionist is not very particularly uh, security vigilant, they might forget about you and carry on doing their regular tasks while you'll be you know, uh, connecting your hacking devices to the client's internal network. Uh, so in addition to that, we also carry out phone phishing if we can. So we can, let's say, call the company's IT help desk team, pretend to be uh, an intern working for the company who's just received a laptop. They're working from home, but uh, they're not very technical and they are trying to log into the laptop, but they are, they are unable to do so. Uh, you can, using, again, various social engineering techniques, um, ask the IT help desk person and try and retrie retrieve some sensitive data from them, such as, again, the antivirus solution they use, uh, the exact operating system they use, all that can help you develop your payloads and carry out you know, more technical phases of your Red Team campaign uh, at later stages. So this is obviously not a very comprehensive list, but these are one of the main three phases that we carry out during Red Teaming projects. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, one particular real-life example of our Red Team project. Well, I'm going to briefly uh, uh, cover two of them, but now I'm going to focus on just one of them. Um, so the first one is was based around us uh, purchasing a Raspberry Pi device uh, and uh, using it to hack the client's internal network. So we purchased the Raspberry Pi device on Amazon, and uh, we also purchased a 4G USB dongle plus the SIM card to be used as one of our red team hacking devices that would be planted on client site. Uh, the Pi was configured to run a specific flavor of the Linux operating system uh, with additional pen test tools and scripts that we had prepared for the project. Uh, so the device had to be configured to talk to our command and control infrastructure over the 4G network. That's why actually we bought uh, a 4G USB dongle and then attached it to the Pi. This could essentially work in any EU country and that was particularly important uh, in our case because one of the client offices that we had to target, that was located in a different country in the EU. Uh, and the all that was done, the communication itself would be done via a secure VPN tunnel that would be established with our command and control infrastructure. 
So one of our consultants managed to uh, break into the organization's building by pretending to be an electrician. And again, using various social engineering techniques, uh, they gained entry to the main office area. Uh, so they managed to connect our Raspberry Pi device to the client's internal network. And because we had done some OSINT prior to that, we knew they were not using 802.1x. So the Raspberry Pi could be connected to the client's internal network and it obtained an IP address on their network. And then at the same time, it connected to our command and control infrastructure over the 4G cellular network. So we managed to connect to the Raspberry Pi device from the UK office and started scanning the client's internal infrastructure and uh, launching our man in the middle attacks. So actual man in the middle attack was uh, basically us targeting the LLMNR and NBTNS protocols. Um, without providing too much details, we managed to retrieve uh, challenge response hashes belonging to a particular workstation. Unfortunately for us, the workstation didn't, or well, the account below, uh, that, that belonged to that workstation, the account did not have domain ad or, or local admin privileges on any of the other machines on the network. So even though we managed to crack the hash because it was a simple password with the two numbers appended to it, we couldn't actually log into any of the machines on the network. So we continued trying to uh, crack the hashes, ad additional hashes we could capture, and then also try to relay them because you don't actually have to crack them straight away. You can actually relay them across the network. Um, so we focused on our attention on the on the attacking the printers that were also connected uh, to the network. Well, we saw the Wi-Fi network that was in the vicinity, and because the Raspberry Pi had been had been configured to communicate with Wi-Fi networks, uh, we managed to connect to the Wi-Fi network, uh, and uh, it was a guest network, but we could see a number of IP addresses on the network, and there was there were a couple of printers exposing admin interfaces to the network. So we managed to access those interfaces, but we didn't have the credentials. So we just Googled the printer model and we managed to gain uh, admin credentials, uh, admin access to those printers. From that, we managed to retrieve quite a lot of sensitive information. So we also then focused our attention back to the uh, man in the middle attacks. By that time, we have, had managed to relay a hash to one workstation. We started enumerating the domain. The domain actually, um, it contained this very simple textbook type vulnerability. We accessed a share that contained a text file. The text file contained plain text credentials. Those credentials belonged to a privileged group domain admins. So essentially we had domain admin privileges and we could connect to the domain controller and we had control of the entire, uh, the client's entire network. Uh, so the second scenario was based uh, around uh, trying to steal a physical device from the client site and then uh, using it to help us plan and carry out additional red team attacks at later stages. Uh, uh, so during the reconnaissance phase, the consultant managed to retrieve an RFID device uh, from a cafe that was located near the client's office. Uh, the second time they attended the office, obviously they managed to gain physical entry with their RFID device. Uh, they uh, identified an area or an office area with lots of workstations. They managed to retrieve one of the uh, all-in-one desktop machines from that office and quickly left the area. We took the hard drive out in our Red Team lab, uh, realized it was unencrypted. So from that, we managed to retrieve a number of Outlook OST files that further revealed that the, the client was using some type of internal ticketing system. So we had the exact format of the emails, the signature, any links included in those emails and so on. So we had the exact replica of those emails. Uh, so we decided to come up with a phishing scenario uh, that would be sent on behalf of, of an IT help desk person targeting about 20 people, um, telling them that they should log into a particular portal and try and review the ticket they had raised. Because those individuals never actually raised that ticket, they would be very inclined to log into that portal, which was actually our landing page capturing user credentials. Again, the landing page was the exact replica of the client's login portal that we had managed to identify during the OSINT phase. Uh, so we targeted about 20 people. One person clicked the link and provided their credentials. Uh, so we quickly retrieved the credentials and tried to log into a different a number of login portals uh, we had already identified during the OSINT phase. And one of those po portals uh, was a another internal type uh, portal. It was essentially the client's internet, part of the internet that was exposed to the internet, which was a bad, very bad idea in the first place. So we managed to log in and we managed to retrieve some sensitive data. Again, the full list of employees, their full names, their date of births, uh, information about the client's internal network and so on. So 
from that point, we obviously uh, have gathered so much PII, but we also wanted to log into other portals. The problem with those portals is that they require two-factor authentication. We didn't have access to the person's mobile number. So we called the IT help desk uh, personnel, pretended to be that person, and using, again, various social engineering techniques, we um, managed to persuade that IT technician uh, to change the mobile number that, were, that we controlled. Uh, they told us it could take up, 20, up to 24 hours. So we waited for 24 hours and tried to log into a number of portals uh, that had the two-factor auth enforced. Uh, still we couldn't, but still we couldn't log in. Till this day, we're not sure what exactly happened, whether the individual actually forgot to change the, um, uh, the number or they actually realized they were being fished and then they eventually, uh, you know, reverted that change as quickly as possible. But regardless of the outcome, that revealed that the IT help desk personnel weren't particularly security vigilant. They never asked for our security, uh, for our employee ID. They never asked any security questions. They never asked for our date of birth. All they asked is for our full name, which we already knew, obviously. Um, so even though uh, we, we consider this, uh, that, that particular uh, a, a scenario quite a successful, one, a successful one, because even though we didn't gain domain admin privileges, we certainly managed to steal some PII data, the physical intrusion was successful, and the fact that uh, the client's hard drive was unencrypted was also a bad idea. Um, so now Sean and I are going to cover two red team attacks launched by a red teamer or a real criminal, and how such successful attacks can be translated into the executive perspective. In other words, what it means to you as a business leader. Uh, so as a criminal uh, or a red teamer, you want to target a particular financial executive by launching a sophisticated spear phishing attack against them. Uh, so for example, you know the type of online bank they access on a daily basis. You can pretend to be that bank, or as a criminal, obviously you wouldn't care about any legal infringements by impersonating a real company. You can send a custom phishing email to that person on behalf of that bank, and if they click the link and access your landing page, the login page will obviously be the exact replica of the real bank page. Uh, and if they're not very security vigilant, they will enter their bank credentials and you will be able to capture them. But on the other hand, if you decide uh, to take a different approach and send a spear phishing an email not related to the bank, uh, maybe you manage to identify their interests and hobbies, and let's say you come up with a good scenario around that, um, in that email, you can include a link pointing to a trusted cloud service provider such as Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive hosting a malicious file such as an HTA shell. And if they open that file on their workstation, provided again, you manage to bypass the on-host security measures such as the antivirus solution, any firewalls and so on, you can um, install a keylogger on their workstation because you'll gain remote control of their machine. And since they are a financial, since they are a financial executive, um, they will most likely be logging into that bank on a regular basis, and you will eventually be able to capture the bank login credentials using the keylogger. And obviously that can have a major negative impact on the company's reputation, as uh, Sean is going to talk about right now. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very, very uh, common attack technique is to use uh, phishing emails to, to dupe people into clicking on links and things. But, so from an exact perspective, what does that mean to me? Well, clearly it's a, a way that we could lose significant sums of money and, 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 and losses. So, so that's a, a, a bad thing. But the other thing to think about as an exec is, have you risk assessed your people? I.e., who are the high risk departments? And you know, typically finance is one of those. Um, but to really understand, right? Okay, we need to address this by raising awareness and, and vigilance within those departments. Uh, one of the biggest areas we see exploited is, is financial fraud in this way. So, so think about your high risk departments. Who are they? HR, legal, finance, uh, and there may be others depending on the nature of your business and make sure that the awareness levels are at the right level within those departments to, to, to prevent successful phishing uh, attempts. Uh, another scenario, which I've already covered in the past, is related to uh, stealing a physical device from the client side by breaking into the building and then taking the hard drive out of that device. So if you identify that the hard drive is unencrypted, then you can obviously retrieve lots of sensitive information, uh, sensitive data, depending from which department uh, the device is stolen. So if it gets stolen from the finance or the HR department, then you can get some PII data, employees' personal details, salary details, payroll data, tax information, medical records, obviously it depends on the company. 
And if the hard drive gets stolen from the tech department, then you can potentially steal some technical data, such as, again, credentials stored in plain text in, in files, uh, sensitive internal network information, IP address ranges, and so on. And uh, similar to the, similarly to the first scenario, um, a business owner should obviously be concerned about such an issue. And as Sean, as Sean is going to briefly cover that right now. Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, breaches of this nature, if you have personal identifiable information as, as part of your organization, you process that, then there is significant reputational damage, but also, you know, monetary penalties in, the, in under GDPR and data protection law. Uh, and also, you, the people need to think about, you know, class action lawsuits. So if, if their data gets breached, as we're seeing uh, um, post breach in some circumstances, class action lawsuits are a real potential business impact that you need to be aware of. So, you know, a, a technical control implemented to stop this type of attack can uh, reduce the risk of all these things happening uh, as an exec. So thanks everyone, thanks uh, for, for joining us. I hope you found the, the presentation useful. Uh, sorry about the, the slightly noisy building site in the background at times, but um, they've decided to crank up some heavy machinery whilst we're trying to uh, put out a, a, a webinar. Um, we're, go, we're gonna have a few minutes just to answer some questions. There's been some questions coming in during the session. Uh, so I'm just gonna have a look at those. Uh, so one of the first questions is, when your red teamers are doing physical intrusion, uh, at what point does it constitute a compromise if someone challenges them? Uh, that's a really good question. All of our, particularly on the physical side, all of our operatives will carry a letter uh, which basically explains that this is a test, that they will have permission to do it, and it will contain contact details of the person that's commissioning the red team so that, you know, in the event of a compromise, they can they can contact that individual. It's a good question around this, what constitutes compromise though, because actually a physical red team, if they are challenged, will normally try to talk their way out of being uh, reprimanded or, or, or held. So they're just sort of, you know, explain that they've got the wrong building or something and try and leave the building. Uh, we did have one circumstance where one of our physical guys was in the basement area where, where vehicles could enter the building and there was someone downstairs who challenged him and he made his excuses and left up the ramp and left, left the building. Uh, he then went and sat in a cafe across the road from the building, but what he didn't know was that the person that actually um, challenged him was the receptionist who sat on the front desk and she could see him sitting in the cafe across the road uh, from the reception area and then called the police. So. You know, these sort of circumstances, when we talk about common pitfalls and things like that, you, know, you really need to think through some of these scenarios. So some customers will say, as soon as you're challenged, then get the letter out and, you know, just do that and, and hopefully carry on with the exercise. Uh, others will ask you to, to try and talk your way out of it. But it's something that you should, you should talk about up front uh, prior to delivering uh, the red team engagement. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, Alex has got a, a yeah, more technically yeah, focused one. So yeah, we just had one more question coming yeah. in. And the question is, it's quite a technical one. Um, do you use the Kerberos technique and how successful is it during during your team projects? Uh, yes, we do use the Kerberos technique and it is a very useful uh, technique that we carry out during red team engagements as well as Active Directory reviews. Um, it helps you escalate your domain privileges in Active Directory and it's a very useful and still it is commonly used nowadays uh, that the technique is um, still quite common amongst red teamers. So as Nataka, we can request Kerberos tickets for any of the service principal names, SPNs, uh, of a particular service account. And SPN is uh, basically a unique identifier of a service instance. And the vulnerability lies in the fact that uh, when the Kerberos service ticket is requested from a domain controller by any domain user, it doesn't have to be a privileged domain user, that ticket is encrypted with the services hash. Um, since any ticket can be requested by any domain user, again, it doesn't have to be a privileged domain user, uh, this means that we can retrieve the hash and then run a dictionary or brute force attack uh, against it in order to retrieve its plain text value. Uh, and it's not uncommon to come across SPNs belonging to, let's say, a Microsoft, uh, service, uh, Microsoft SQL service account, um, and that account, in turn, can be part of a privileged group. Uh, such as uh, the domain admins group, or even in, or even the enterprise admins group, um, 
So if, let's say, you manage to crack that uh, services hash, you will essentially gain domain admin's privileges or even enterprise admin privileges. Uh, in regards to how successful it is, I would say about 30 to 40 percent success rate uh, during pretty much every red team and Active Directory review that we carry out. Uh, it obviously depends on the company's password policy and how well their service accounts are protected against brute force attacks. But it is indeed a very useful technique. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, so just a quick reminder to say that we will send a follow-up email next week with a Q&A summary and recording of the session. Thank you again for attending. And if you want to contact us, please feel free to email us at uh, hello at irmsecurity.com.